This is part two. <clears throat> I need to find where we left off, but this is part two of the chapter one lecture notes, Introduction to Biology. Um, eukaryotic cells. Here we go. Slide 14 um, is where we left off. And let me move my head in lecture one. Okay, and then here we go. Okay. Okay, sorry. So um, there are two types of cells. In the last lecture, we learned about the first type, which are prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells have no nucleus. Um, they're always unicellular. Um, they have no membrane-bound organelles. They consist of bacteria and archaea. Eukaryotic cells are pretty much every other type of organism. So eukaryotic cells have a true nucleus. That means the DNA is enclosed in a membrane. Sorry. And then they also have other membrane-bound organelles, um, like we learned in the cell chapter in Bio 111. So examples would be mitochondria, lysosomes, all of those different organelles that we learned are membrane bound. So eukaryotic cells um, contain membrane bound organelles and they contain a nucleus. And these are some relative cell sizes. I really just want to point out one thing to you about cell size because we are learning about prokaryote. So you all looked at um, your cheek cells probably last semester in Bio 111. Um, you may not have, but if you did a lab, um, I'm sure that at some point you viewed animal and plant cells under the microscope and they were large enough you could see them on the low power. Well, a bacteria is hard to see on high power and you really have to use the oil immersion 100x power to see them you know, um, well and you still don't really see a lot of detail. So a bacterium compared to a eukaryotic cell, a bacterium is about the same size as a mitochondria. And you can see in the plant cell, so this is about the size of a bacterium compa compared to a eukaryotic cell, the size of a prokaryotic cell compared to a eukaryotic cell. Okay, then we have biodiversity, and it's important, I know that you understand what diversity means, that it's the variety of different characteristics, but, um, and we can see diversity here because what we're looking at are different species. So there's variety among different species of living organisms, but I can also look at one population, the tiger population. Populations are members of the same species that live in the same habitat. So um, like a particular jungle, the, all the tigers that live in that jungle. So they're gonna vary in their traits. They're gonna be, um, there's gonna be a certain number of males, a certain number of females, that's a trait, your, your gender. There's gonna be tigers that are faster and tigers that are slower, you know, tigers that are larger, tigers that are smaller, um, you know, tigers that prefer one food source over another, I don't know, you know, there's a lot of different traits that they can have. So it's variety among the different um, species and then variety within species. And then phylogeny, this is the relationship of the three domains, the relationship between bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And I just really want to refer to the rooted phylogenetic tree. So what you can see here is there was organism number one about 3.8 billion years ago. And then, I can't remember, but I know at least a billion years later um, <clears throat> came Organism two, and organism two was the ancestor to two different um, organisms. And so I'll say organism A um, diverged, evolved into the different bacteria. And then organism B, here at this point, diverged into archaea and eukarya. So what you can see is that the archaea are here and the eukarya are here. So they are more closely related to each other than either one is to bacteria. And it, it, it's, it's common to get that confused because 
archaea and bacteria are both prokaryotes, but they're not as closely related to each other as the archaea and the eukarya are. The archaea actually, the archaea and the eukarya actually evolved from a common ancestor separate from the bacteria. Okay, then we have classification, which is taxonomy. And you can see up here um, golden retriever. And um, starting with its domain, the domain is one of three groups. In this case, since the cells of an um, animal contain a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles, um, they're in the domain eukarya. So this um, golden retriever is in domain eukarya, kingdom animalia, because it's an animal. And then the phylum is the phylum that includes mostly vertebrates, mostly organisms with a backbone. Um, some of the organisms don't have a backbone, but they do have a, a nerve cord running along their back rather than their stomach. So that's the phylum chordata, they're called chordate. And then the class is um, the animals that have hair and mammary glands produce milk. So it's mammalia or just mammals is fine. And we know that um, dogs are carnivores, although domestic dogs do eat carbohydrates more so um, than they would like wolves in the wild. But they're in the order carnivora because naturally they're carnivorous, they, they are meat eating. Um, the family that they're in is the family that includes the, um, the canines, you know, so Canidae. And then the genus is Canis, the species is Canis lupus. The species name comes from binomial nomenclature, which, which means two names, two part name. Um, the species name starts with the genus, which is Canis, and it's capitalized. And then the species, the particular species name is lowercase. So when you say the species name, you put the genus and the species together, Canis lupus. Now, um, Canis lupus can be divided into subspecies, which include wolves and domestic dogs. And so the subspecies here is called Can Canis lupus familiaris. Um, now, for you to remember the order of classification, there is a sentence. Um, my writing is awful, but it's dumb kids prefer cookies over fresh green spinach. I don't know if that sentence makes sense or not, but it's easy to remember, and that will help you remember the order of the classification groups, okay? Um, on this slide, we have different branches of biology. I know there's a few quiz questions. Um, I would expect you to know microbiology as we offer that course um, here at Wilson Community College, um, and that's going to be the study of bacteria and archaea and um, maybe a little bit on viruses, but some uh, microorganisms um, called protozoans that are eukaryotic, but um, it's mainly single-celled or unicellular organisms. So it's, it's um, you're using the microscope throughout the entire course. And then we have um, zoology, how you pronounce that word, and that's the study of animals. We don't offer that here at Wilson, but they do offer zoology as a class um, in biology degrees or in science degrees um, at four-year universities. So this class is like a prereq for zoology and also botany. Botany is the study of specifically plants. And then we have um, molecular biology, which is um, it's referring to molecules, but it's Specifically, what you normally study in a molecular biology class would be DNA. Um, that is the molecule that you concentrate on mostly. All right, now, an introductory science course has to include a little bit of information on the scientific method. Um, here it's written as scientific inquiry, but we call it the scientific method sometimes. And the steps of the scientific method begin with you identifying a problem that you want to solve or a question that you have. The hypothesis, um, I've heard it described as educated guess, 
but um, really, if you have a problem or a question, you're going to Google it. You're going to start out by finding as much information as you can about it. So when you form the hypothesis, it's not as much of a guess. Um, guess is kind of misleading. You can, um, you can do your experiment and find out that the evidence doesn't support your hypothesis. You can falsify your hypothesis. Um, but usually you know enough information that um, you're heading in the right direction when you make your hypothesis. So a hypothesis is an explanation to your problem. It is a suggested explanation. Suggested explanation. Now, a, sorry, a hypothesis has to be two things. It has to be testable, has to be falsifiable. You have to um, write a statement about your problem that you could do a test and prove it false, prove it to be false. Then you're going to design your experiment. And when you design your experiment, it needs to be a controlled experiment. So you'll control things um, like the group that's, that, that's being um, changed in some way versus the control group that you're keeping you know, at normal conditions. You're not changing. So you want to keep everything the same. You want to keep their container the same. You want to keep their food, nutrition the same, their amount of light the same. You know, there are things that you want to keep the same so that you're only testing your variable that your um, problem is, is, is about, you know. Um, if we do an experiment on plants, and I have one plant and I expose it to light, and one plant that I put it in darkness, then I need to keep everything else the same. The plant needs to be the same type. I don't need to have a, you know, orchid and a um, daisy, you know, um, but they need to be the very same type of plant, like both um, tobacco plants, for example. Um, and they need to be, everything else that they get should be the same, the same amount of water, the same amount of soil, the same size container. Um, Everything should be the same, same temperature, except the variable that you're studying, which is the amount of light. So that's how that's what is meant by a controlled experiment. You also want to consider the size of your sample. Most of the time, it is better to have a larger sample size that makes your results more believable, more um, uh, makes you able to prove, not prove your results, but um, gives more support to your hypothesis when you have a larger sample size. Um, and bias is when um, you can avoid bias by setting up a controlled experiment, okay? So now the experimental variables are independent and dependent variables. The independent variable is what you change in the experiment, sorry. So in the plant experiment, the independent variable would be the amount of light. The dependent variable would be the growth of the plant. Dependent variable is always what you measure in the experiment. And then after you do your experiment, you've probably gathered some data and you're gonna look at it and interpret it and then decide um, on your conclusion, which is going to be either the data support my hypothesis or the data um, do not support my hypothesis. Okay, now um, then you have your quick review, the defining characteristics of biological life. That's on the very first slide after the um, title page. Um, order, um, homeostasis, maybe I can think of all of them. Homeostasis, growth and development, reproduction, um, metabolism, energy, um, uh, regulation, and I can't, if there's any more, I can't think of them, but make sure you learn those and make sure you know the two different kinds of cells, prokaryotic, no nucleus, eukaryotic has a nucleus. The classification system, starting with domain and ending with um, species, make sure you understand how the um, binomial nomenclature, how you do that. The species name consists of the genus capitalized, the species name lowercase, and the whole entire word is either in italics or underlined. Then biology is the study of living things, and the key components of scientific inquiry we just went over, the hypothesis, the experiment, the, um, the results, 
um, independent and dependent variables, controlled experience.